There was plenty of snow cover early in the week, but as the week progressed and the temperatures rise to the mid-60s, the snow was replaced with mud. We had some visitors helping us to feed the muskrats on one of the warm days when there was still snow on the ground. Just a few days later, the ponds were completely cleared. Cleared from ice, at least, anyway. But there were mats of algae forming in Morton's Pond. Many birds returned back north, including bluebirds and blackbirds, and woodcocks and geese, including our old friend Roddy. It looks like his eye patches have gotten a little larger. And unfortunately, he returned alone. We suspected last fall that his spouse had died. We hung up nine screech owl nest boxes this week. They were given to us by a professor at Hamilton College who is doing a research project on screech owls this year. We've had some bluebirds examining the already existing boxes, an indication that it's time to start cleaning them out for the new season. And it's nice to hear them singing from the treetops again. Since the snows melted, the moss has been thriving. It should continue to do so until the heat of summer dries it out. Toward the end of the week, we received a call about a grouse that had been hit by a car. We attempted a rescue, but the damage was too great and the grouse did not survive. We put it in the woods so an animal could scavenge an easy meal. It is unfortunate when an animal dies in this manner, but we don't waste the opportunity to observe it closely. It was interesting to see the pectinations, these little parallel flaps that facilitate its ability to walk on snow. Caterpillars began unthawing this week and becoming active. I also noticed a honeybee buzzing about. And there was a daddy longleg crawling about the surface of the melting snow. One thing that I've come to realize about these winter active spiders is that they're almost exclusively active hunters rather than web spinners. This spider is a leaf curling sack spider of the genus Clebonia. The spiders I have found in previous weeks also include other sack spiders, ground hunters, and wolf spiders. I wonder if some of their food comes from frozen insects falling out of trees. It's been warm enough this week for the midges to begin swarming. I didn't realize last week that the term midge was used to describe tiny flies from many different families. But all of the midges that we see active this time of year are from the family Chironomidae. Adults of this family are short-lived some species may live a week and a half, others only a couple of hours. We did see this swarm a couple of days in a row. The midges swarm together for the purpose of mating. The swarm consists of mostly males quote-unquote dancing. In 1965, a Finnish entomologist, Jaco Sergimaki, 
did a study on the dances of a species of Chironomidae. Although the species that he studied was different than the ones here, I'm assuming that the behavioral characteristics can be transferred throughout the family. According to Sir Jamaki, the dances consist of two basic flight patterns. The first is that they zigzag back and forth, moving up and down in the column. The second is a loop. As they circle around in a loop, they do little somersault-like maneuvers in order to change directions. The midges at the top of the swarm perform faster loops than those at the bottom. Furthermore, as the swarm increases in size, the average speed of the loops also increases. As the males are dancing, the females are perched nearby watching. When the female is ready, she will slowly fly in a straight line directly through the swarm. If she makes it through the swarm without being captured by a male, she will either circle back and repeat the line or go back to her resting perch. When she is captured by a male, the two will tumble to the ground and copulation will occur, usually in under two seconds. Then the female will fly off to lay her eggs and the male will return to the swarm to continue his dance. The warm weather has also aroused the green stink bugs from their hibernation. They stay frozen in the leaf litter all winter long, and then when they thaw out, they are some of the first insects to mate. Perhaps this early breeding benefits them because they have less predators and egg predators to worry about. Of course, there's also less competition for food sources, but that probably doesn't affect the stink bug so much since they eat almost any form of plant matter. They will drink juices from plant stems and leaves and seeds and nuts and fruits often to farmers lament. As with all true bugs, they have piercing mouth parts in which they poke a hole in whatever food source they are eating and then they release digestive enzymes in there and then slurp it back up. Although they eat generally anything and are common throughout North America, in most cases I don't believe that they're quite as destructive as many pest control websites portray them. With the spring-like weather lately, the birds have been more vocal, including the blue jays, which are famous for their sometimes unpredictable calls. This one sounds as if it's imitating a hawk. One morning, we heard some unfamiliar call notes, but chalked it up to a blue jay. When we passed by a couple hours later, the calls were still happening. It turned out to be raccoons. Three of them total. Two were mating, and a third was fighting with the mating pair. Most likely, he wanted in on the action. In the end, the two continued mating, and the third ran up the tree a little farther to lick his wounds. Eventually, he climbed down the tree and limped off into hiding. Unfortunately, due to the threat of rain, Neither Matt or myself had our cameras with us. When I came back later with a camera, the two were still curled up side by side in the tree. By that afternoon, however, even those two had left. Good, good, nice. 
big white We've been getting quick glances of a mink at the beaver pond. Two days in a row, I saw it go into a bush and a rabbit come out. This makes me wonder if perhaps the rabbit is placing a scent somewhere in the bush as a decoy so that when a predator goes in, it can make a quick escape. And speaking of scents, skunks have been very active this past week. And I've been hearing from a lot of owls lately, although I can't film them after dusk. But one morning, in broad daylight, the passerines that we feed alerted us to the presence of an owl. Roosting in the white pine was a northern sawwet owl. With an average length of seven to eight inches, similar to that of a cardinal, sawwets are by far North America's smallest owl. It is about breeding season for these guys, so this one probably just stopped over while on its search for a more suitable breeding grounds. They are cavity nesters and show high preference for conifer forests. Apparently, they are not uncommon, just uncommonly seen to, the, to their small stature and secretive habits. But some populations may be in peril due to a decline in habitat. I went up to the power plant in Oswego this week to drop off the Peregrine Nest Box, which will be erected on one of these two smokestacks. While I was there, I couldn't resist stopping by the harbor to see what kind of bird activity was happening. There were some long-tailed ducks. They come as far south as the Great Lakes in the winter time but during breeding season, they'll return north to the Arctic. I did notice that the males seem to be loners, while the females seem to be more gregarious. I watched a group of females feeding for a little while. At least that's what I assume, since I never actually saw any of them bring food to the surface. It is said that they forage at the bottoms for mollusks and arthropods. I noticed that every dive they took lasted about 30 seconds. More interestingly, I noticed that they all dove down together, then rose to the surface together. Time after time, their dives seemed to be coordinated. I would like to see what's happening underwater to see if they're actually working together to forage. Or perhaps they just feel safer together in a flock. Either way, it was interesting watching the dives. I also watched a flock of coots for a little while. Their flock was not as tight and their dives were not synchronized. I did see them bring food to the surface, however. It seemed to be a lot of seaweed. However, I'm pretty sure they weren't actually eating the seaweed 
but sifting through for some more protein-rich foods. Either way, there were no signs of teamwork for these birds. And that ends another exciting week in nature.